okay, preparing to stream. It will go on my Facebook profile and then I will share it. And anybody can share it from my, my profile. Okay, so the chat will be active, hopefully, on my screen. This meeting is being live streamed, got it, all right. So it is going to be live streamed on my personal profile. And all right, let's see. Okay, so I am live. Okay, that is working over there. Share. Share to a group. Anybody has access to Geo? That Geo group? Yeah, I have. Okay, can you share, go to my profile if you can? And please share it uh, on the geo group. Okay, I'll try. Okay, all right. uh, I don't want to look like I'm spamming, right? So it has to be somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Live residency rank order list webinar. R, okay, and let me. Share the link also from Zoom. So anybody who's already watching, we're gonna be live in five minutes. We're gonna start the session in five minutes. We're already live, but we're gonna start the session in five minutes. Okay, so copy invitation. Copy invitation and that has been done. All right, and close. Post. <clears throat> so the thing is, it has to be approved. Normally, all these posts have to be approved. So hopefully, we can get, I'm going to message somebody, we can approve these posts. All right. Uh, Dr. Umar, I have shared to Geo Group. Excellent. All right. Hopefully, somebody will pick it up. We are in the meeting. All right. Najam, I sent you a message. Um, okay, you sent it to me. Good, excellent. Morning. Good morning. How are you doing, sir? Good. How are you? I'm well. Um, how is it? I think you're not too far away from me. I have. I had no idea. You're in Allentown, right? So yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple of people nearby. A couple of people nearby. An hour, an hour away. So. Yes, not not far away. All right. How long have you been here in uh, Allentown? I've been, I've been here in this uh, about seven years now. Okay, wow. You're right. Yeah. Um, with Lehigh Valley. Yeah, Valley, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. I think the hospital is, I think, an hour and 15, 20 minutes from where I live. But from Geisinger, Wyoming Valley, it's even less. It's about 50 minutes. So Okay, right, right, right. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I I actually work at the general hospital mm -hmm. there as well, right? Uh, on occasions, so a little familiar. So I'm gonna be organizing a little bit of this, and yeah, we have uh, Dr. Najam Sakib. He's also gonna be a host today. Okay, good. And yeah, Dr. Basik Mirza, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Good to have everybody. All right, good to have everybody. And uh, okay, 
organizing a few things. Anybody has any questions, you can please put them in the comments and we will look to address any questions. They could be off topic as well. Um, we will try to avail this opportunity to ask any questions related to residency and even after, uh, after the match, um, what to expect, anything like that. Um, we we'll look to address all these questions. And we will get going soon enough. <clears throat> all right, so, so I'm gonna have a couple of my questions that I've prepared uh, regarding the rank order lists, um, what you should be considering when you're deciding on your program that you prefer, what should you be preferring? And Dr. Vasik Mirza, he is a program director, so he will be detailing his point of view from the program director side. And Dr. Najam, uh, he will be talking about from the, so he's a recent graduate, of, not a recent graduate, but he is more recent than most of us. So I think he will have good feedback of the whole experience and after, after the after residency, after the match as well. And it'll be great to have his input and his experience um, in, in interviews and selecting candidates um, when he was part of uh, selecting or helping out with selection of residents. So that would be great. Okay, so I think we should be going live. Uh, I think I'll probably give one more minute and uh, people to join in. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. We will be officially starting this meeting. I'm Dr. Umar Khan. I'm here in Pennsylvania. I'm a graduate of Ilama Iqbal Medical College, 2007. And we have an esteemed uh, panel today. And we have both uh, aspects that we will be covering today. And we will be covering uh, both a program director's viewpoint and Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Vasik Mirza is here. Dr. Vasik Mirza, he is a program uh, director, actually near where I am uh, living, but an hours away from where I am, I had no idea. He is the program director at Geisinger Northeast Internal Medicine Residency Program. He's also an associate professor of medicine at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Mirza, how, how, um, uh, how, how are you doing today? Good, good. It's a nice right, day. Right. The sun is out, so can't complain. Sun is out, and I, yeah, sun is out, and I believe it is a little warm right now. <laughs> it's, it's not. not uh, it's not minus fifteen degrees centigrade right now. It's fifteen <laughs> degrees, so you know. Yeah. Right. Right. That's at least good. it looks nice. It looks nice, at least bright and sunny. And then uh, we have Dr. Najam Sakip. He um, is from a Temple University. He, he did an undergrad in Temple University in bio and criminal justice. That is interesting to know, of course. And he studies medicine in the law at Ross School, the Ross University. And he's uh, currently uh, did his residency and now doing his cardiology fellowship at the Wright Center. And he also uh, is involved with interventional um, cardiology with the University of Cincinnati. I hope I got this introduction correct. Najim, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Thanks. And that, that was a pretty good introduction. Uh, the only uh, disclaimer I have is that I was hired by Dr. Vasik Mirza. Excellent. So we have a uh, mentor and prodigy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. That is, that is good to know. So uh, we're going to get the ball rolling and we have a good amount of people joining and please uh, share this. This is going... Uh, live on my Facebook profile. If, if anybody is on my Facebook profile, please share this uh, video to your profile as well so we can uh, it can benefit as many people as possible. And this is also being shared on the Mkana um, Facebook group as well as, as well as on the Geo Iqbalians um, Facebook group, which is more of a global Iqbalians platform. Uh, this is, of course, brought to you by Mkana, the uh, Ilam Iqbal uh, Alumni Association here in the US. So rank order list is the topic for today. And we look to cover additional topics um, as well that you may have questions regarding. And since this residency season is coming to a close and the rank order list is a sort of a contested topic based on how you should be ranking your programs. And we have a program, direct, program director's perspective here uh, as well. So we will have some good input. Uh, what are the minds uh, we'll go into the minds of the program director as well uh, with regards to how they rank candidates 
and what they will recommend you to do given your situation. Uh, so just to get the ball rolling, uh, how should applicants consider, what should applicants consider when they're looking to uh, decide on a program? One is your, your own preference. That is one, your desired geographic location. Do you like the program? Or second, for any international medical graduate, you have to be consider. You have to consider the fact that hey, you are an inter international medical graduate. Are you a strong candidate or a relatively weaker candidate or a candidate in the middle? Based on that, you will see what is your uh, uh, criteria, and then you will see what are your long term goals. If you want an academic position, if you want to go to academics later on, or you prefer a community program and you want and you want to do the basics of medicine, that is of course very essential as well. And then you have to see what is the combination of um, residents in that program. And lastly, probably you will also look at what, is your what are your future goals? One, of course, the academic goals, and then what type of specialty you want to go into that you have to consider if they do have a residency, if they do have a fellowship program in that, in that uh, location, that is of course gonna be fairly uh, important. So I will uh, like to ask, um, uh, uh, Dr. Atik Mirza from his residency program director, I'm sorry, Dr. Vasik Mirza from his uh, residency program director uh, uh, experience, what general tips can he provide for candidates, especially candidates from foreign countries um, uh, with regards to the rank order list? Yeah, thank you, Omar. So I think you basically gave all, all the basic points that someone has to look at it. And again, there's a difference between whether you are a US grad or an international graduate, because you have to be mindful that they are slightly different pathways. There are some limitations, but at the same time, you don't want to sell yourself short. So obviously you have to, uh, you've applied, you've given your interviews, so you know where your strengths and weaknesses are. So your choice and where you want to be uh, is important. You know, geographically, in some ways, when you are a U.S. grad, people have very, you know, specific geographical locations. As a foreign graduate, we are a little wide open unless we have strong family ties. Uh, we can be anywhere. So, which is which makes the playing field wide open, which is a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, you have to see really what program uh, spoke to you, how you connected with the faculty and the residents. It's really important to be in a place where you feel you know, similar minds or someplace you can feel comfortable. Uh, unfortunately, with us doing things virtually, we are not able to see uh, you know, the true culture of the program that we were able to do when we went in person. Uh, so sometimes talking to the faculty and the residents will give you a good idea. Uh, so keep that in mind. But at the same time, you have to see what your long-term plans are. And obviously, if you're looking into fellowships, you're looking into uh, academic plans, it changes a little bit. Uh, community programs will be able to give you that option uh, and you can get into good fellowships. You know, Najam is here and you know it, he went to a community program but they had a cardiology fellowship. So it, it works out. Uh, a lot depends on how you plan it and how, what kind of uh, scholarly work and how you build your resume. But at the same time, yes, there are going to be some limitations compared to a bigger program. So keeping that in mind, uh, plan that accordingly. Uh, the third thing is going to be, again, you have to be mindful of, you know, what your strengths and weaknesses are. What is your reach place that you can apply to? So you have to make that fine balance. You want to reach for something that you can best achieve. But at the same time, some people make a mistake. And I, going back, you know, several years, I made that mistake and applying to places that really I didn't have much of a choice. And I felt that that made a difference in uh, the kind of response I got. So once you have done the interviews, go ahead, line it up. The beauty of the rank list is, uh, that it favors the applicant. So as much as us, you know, I can make my rank order list and I'm, I'm going to be working on it shortly, is going to be based on who I like. But ultimately the choice that you make is paramount. Uh, so the computer system that generates the NRMP, the way it works in, it'll take your choice first and then matches with what the programs are looking for. 
so once you have figured out what your order is, you know, just just go for it uh, because there is no harm in putting a very highly ranked program high that you interviewed in, even if you feel that it's not giving, going to give you an option, why not? You know, what if you made an impact and they do rank you high enough that you can match with them? Exactly. Um, Let me clarify this, this question. I, this is the crux of the matter here with rank order list. So the question basically is, should a candidate rank a program that they like the best? They personally like the, uh, they, let, me, let me reframe this. Should they like, should they go for the program that they feel that they will be accepted into? Or should they rank the program highest, which is the best program that they have interviewed at? I think that's the, that's the correct question here. No, they can, uh, they can rank the program that they feel is the best program that they can get into. Even if they feel that it's not uh, going to be, you know, less likely that they will match there. There is no harm in doing that because the rank order list, the way the chips fall in the end can be complicated. So if I have a rank order list and I put my top most candidates at the top, you know, maybe one of them will rank us high enough that will match with us. So, but if both of those things align, you'll be able to get into that program. So go for the best possible program that you have on your list that you have interviewed uh, and it'll favor you. So there's no harm in doing that. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Najam, any thoughts on this on this question? Um, yeah, I mean, that that's, I think that was the same exact question when we were going through the match as well. Um, the, the struggle of an international graduate is a little bit different uh, because we, as Dr. Mirza said, we don't have geographical set holes unless exactly we have families here or not. But I think the biggest part that we need to understand how rank order list has been came into medical field, it all came from economics, right? Uh, so it comes from the matter of the fact that which will, which will most likely, which will most likely benefit the investor. And in our case, investors are our candidates. So first thing first that, as Dr. Meza said, do not sell yourself short. Please do not think that you guys are any less or anything different when it comes to any other medical graduates. You guys are all amazing. You guys have done amazing jobs. You have passed your USMLEs. You have passed your ECFMGs. You have done amazing. Already you have proven to be above certain IQ levels. So when you're ranking, always look for your personal benefit. Um, because remember, even though securing a residency in the United States of America is an amazing thing, it's, an, it's a great feeling, but at the same time, remember you're giving your life to it. Uh, you're gonna give yourself, you're gonna give a program, a candidate who they should be proud of and all that stuff. So you should ask from the program, all that stuff for yourself as well. And do not make a mistake of saying, okay, just because a program director sent me an email, I should rank them high. Or just because I think that X, Y, Z is in the program, I should rank that program high. It should be all based on your preferences. It should be based on how you felt about the program. It should be based on how you think your future lies ahead. Do you want to go into a subspecialty like cardiology, which is a competitive or GI competitive specialties? Does that program offer those subspecialties? All that does matter into your calculation. And there is a list of like 30, 40 bullet points that you can look at like interpersonal skills, how you had a day with the house staff. And of course, in Zoom days, we don't have that interaction with the uh, faculty and all, but all that when it comes together, it will all come down to, did you like the program? And if you like the program, rank that program higher than maybe even some of the prestigious programs that you might not think rank you higher. Right, excellent. So basically, whether you are a strong candidate or a, uh, mid-level candidate or your scores are not that great or your uh, your CV is not that great, you should, correct me if I'm wrong guys, you should consider, you rank highest, the best, pro the best program you think for your future. Whether correct. you are going to go into it or not, whether they're gonna rank you or not, you should rank that top level program, the best program, the best fellowships, the best, I mean, pay, the best location, have that in your mind, with with that make that make a list of those programs make it accordingly one two three four the best program should be on top and if that any of those programs happen to rank you the the algorithm will fix you up with regards to your preferences so your preferences will be 
cater to first before the preferences of the program, before the preferences of Dr. Dr. Vasek Mirza. But that still means that you, uh, you and the program both like each other because you ranked each other and they are looking forward to having you as residents at their program. Is that, is that an accurate assessment? assessment? Exactly. And, you know, you know, by saying that, obviously, I am uh, uh, shooting myself in the foot because, obviously, uh, <laughs> as a community program, I'm asking my candidates to go and rank a program that, you know, appears a little bit higher on the totem pole. But again, it doesn't have to be the best and the top program. You know, so if you go and you interview at Harvard, but there is a program that's at a different level but you feel that is the right fit for you. And could be from any reason. It could be because you have family there. It could be a program that really clicks with you. And you really feel that, yes, if I have, were to be given a choice, I will pick that program. You know, make sure that that topmost program, whichever way it is, it could be academically, it could be from personal choice, that program is at your top choice because that's the only way you can ensure that that will be the program you'll be matched in if everything falls in place. Because if you say, you know what, that program looks good on paper, is a higher rank program, I'm not really sure about it, and you rank that high and they choose you, you will go there. And you may end up losing out on a program that really speaks to you. So, you know, there are a lot of things. And ultimately, as a candidate, you are the right person to answer that question. You know, I, uh, when I was interviewing and after that and going after looking for jobs and uh, interviewing different places. They were places that I've walked in and as much as they were good hospitals, it just didn't feel right. And you feel, okay, you know, I don't know if I will be comfortable here. So if there are question marks, you can always push them down. Right. 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 Excellent. So one question that everybody asks is that somebody, of course, I mean, when you are an international graduate, you want to show your interest in a program. And that is especially important before the rank order list is finalized. So that programs think it okay that we will not be wasting this candidate and this candidate also looks good on paper and we should rank this candidate higher. What can candidates do at this current point when there's still a little bit of time before the rank order lists are finalized in most places? What can it potentially do? What do you feel is a good way for candidates to contact them? Or do you think, okay, you've seen everything and you don't want everybody to contact you? Or what, what do you feel on this question? So, it, it, it's a complicated question <laughs> and because, you know, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer because every program director is different. Everyone looks at it differently. Uh, some people just ignore any incoming mail or emails completely. Uh, some people respond. Uh, so personally, when I get an email from a candidate after an interview, I make it a point to respond to it because, again, I think that's common courtesy and also it actually gives me an opportunity to reach back to a good candidate. So someone who really I liked, you know, I have an opportunity to reach back and show them that, yes, you know what, we also had a good time talking to you and, and possibly for them to rank our program higher. Wonder However, why, wonder why I never got the reply. You did? <laughs> wonder why I never got the reply. I'm sure you did. Or maybe maybe I was too stressed out at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, which can be tedious, and it's 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 not that that you know easy to keep up with. However, the problem is that you know the emails and people when they start responding. So, you start getting an email from a candidate after the interview, and you get one around Christmas, and one around New Year, and one in January, and one right before the rank order list. So there are a lot of those things that can accumulate and can get too much. So I think personally, once you have a good interview and you have a good application and you've made an impact, that is usually enough to make that impact. So a lot of the time, you know, that does not change. So when we create our rank order list, it's based on that impression right. directly. The second part is going to be Obviously, there are opportunities in different programs. So there are programs who are close to you that you can go and visit. So our program will say, yes, you know, if you want to come in and take a look at the hospital, you can come in and we'll give you a quick tour. In COVID days, it's limited. 
But at the same time, we also recognize that not everyone can come in. So I have a candidate who is applying from New York may drive up to our program, but someone who is applying for Florida may not be able to come in. So it should not go against them. Uh, yes, if you come in and you meet everyone in person, it can give you a little bit of that extra edge because now we have seen you in person. Emails are not a bad thing to do, but you have to be very careful because you, it can be abused very quickly. And I, I wrote something on the APNA Young Physicians website about it, is when you reach out to the programs, you can certainly call them, you know, let them know, send them an email and say, I'm interested, I'm going to rank you high. From a candidate perspective, there is no restriction on you telling them that you are ranking the program number one. You can say that. Programs are restricted on how much we can ask you, but you can show your intentions to the program that how high you want to rank them. But at the same time, your emails, if you do send, need to be very concise. Just think about the fact that an average person, when you look at your email, mostly, especially the program directors who are on the run, are looking at your emails on their phones. I hardly look at an email on my desktop, which means that I have a limited amount of space where I can really see what you are trying to tell me. So if you send me an essay and I have to scroll it, I may not get to the point. So if you have four impactful lines saying, I'm still very interested, I saw your program, it's high on my list, I would love to work with you, that's it. That's all I need to know. I'll look at it, the name will imprint on my mind, I'll remember that this person made that effort. And when I'm making the list, it can actually come back and help me, you know, maybe it'll make a difference. So, but if you start to do it too much and send multiple emails, then it gets annoying. Uh, it clogs up the whole system. So be careful when you do that. Another thing that I wrote on that when I was talking, do not try to make personal contacts with any program. It's a professional situation. You are trying to make an impact. So sending a friend request on Facebook, and trust me, I've had so many of them that I can't count. It, it, in my mind, it automatically puts you off the rank order list because that's crossing a line. You know, that is a very, yeah, yeah. You, I think you got, you're absolutely right. And sorry, sorry to interrupt a little bit. Uh, got it. You have to respect per, personal boundaries, and of course. When you're reaching somebody on a personal setting, let's say um, Facebook or anywhere else, as Dr. Um, uh, uh, Wasik is mentioning, it, it feels a little creepy. Is that the right word? I, I don't know if that's the right word. That's right. The word. You can you can use that, and it's you know, and it, anything like you know, even if it's LinkedIn, like it's it's still social media. It's still a, an outside the professional boundaries. Um, a personal email, even if you get hold of somebody's personal email address, you know, don't use it. You know, there is, a, there is a business email address. It's out in the open. You know, use that. Absolutely, that's fair game. But those little things can make a difference. And some may ignore it, but in some cases that may make or break your application. So, you know, that's something really important that you can take to your heart and even, you know, let your other colleagues know. Right. Okay, we have a few questions. Before that, I'm going to have a Dr. Najam share his uh, recent experience, not that recent, but it, it, of course he, he was yeah. relatively I, recent. I, I just want to add to Dr. Mirza's point that when you're writing an email, consider it as, as an elevator pitch um, or like a billboard that you want to, that somebody passing by reads it. Because remember the program directors and the other members of the committee are also still taking care of the patients. They're still busy on their day to day. They're, that's not their only job. They're part of the program and all, but they're also teaching residents. They're all dealing with their daily stuff, their own families. If this is an elevator pitch email, that would serve you the best. Uh, as Dr. Miza said, do not write essays. Um, from my personal experiences, I have done three matches so far. The first match is an internal medicine match for me. There are 7,000 or more candidates applying and all of them are sending emails versus let's say Sub subspecialty matches, there are lesser candidates and even super subspecialty like intervention, there are lesser candidates. So you tend to see more response from program directors on a super specialty level, but definitely at the internal medicine level, you're gonna sending, you have to assume that your email is gonna become 17th or 18th. So if somebody is not replying, don't feel bad and don't take it personally. Um, that's just, they read it, they understand it. Uh, they took note of that in their mind. Uh, 
positive or negative, that depends on who the person is reading. That's not your fault. Uh, just move on with that. Don't keep sending them 70,000 emails again and again and again just to get a reply uh, because that would be a negative thing. No, that's important. You know, not getting a response back does not mean that it's not acknowledged. Yeah. Um, you know, again, sometimes, so from, for example, from Friday till now, I've had about 35 emails. Right. And these are people who have already interviewed with us. So, you know, there's so much you can do, especially on a weekend. So those things are important. And again, that also goes for, you know, written letters uh, or calling the program and leaving messages on the program administrator's voicemail. You know, those things are just hardly looked at. You know, email a quick, short elevator pitch, as Najam said, which is exactly what you need to do, is the best approach. Right, and I think I would like to sum this, this at least this question up a little bit, and then we'll get to some of the questions that we have. So make sure it is sweet, nice and sweet and short. And you highlight, let's say, for example, in if you are in an Illinois area and you're looking for a program in that area, just and if you are already living there, say, I'm already here and um, I have these connections and contacts, this is the one, one reason. And based on your program features, I think I'll be a good candidate. Few lines, snapshot that, hey, uh, just, to, just to, I did say this in my interview that I'm very eager for this program. It's a quick uh, five line email. Um, and I think that that should be it. Not a long paragraph, nothing. The question that I wanna get to is um, that of course, there's a deadline for the rank order list for the programs from, from the program director. But what is the best time for anybody, not to, of course, bombard, but what, what do you think is the best time for them to send an email to a program director uh, that, hey, this is my one, not, uh, not that this is their only email, but when should they actually send you that email like a week before or a month before? Of course, every program will be different, but based on your experience, what is the best time that you're actually thinking about it that, hey, okay, I'm working on the rank order list right now, if I receive, if I potentially received an email at this point, are I am more likely to consider that email uh, when I'm making my list? So I think there are different parts. And again, the timeline of a program can be very different. Uh, a lot of programs, so it, I would say, and again, there's no right or wrong answer, but the sweet spot would ideally be somewhere just after everyone has finished interviewing, because it, interviewing is an overwhelming process. Uh, like Najam was saying, you know, six, 7,000 applications. So last year we had about 5,000 applicants. We interviewed 170 people and we have 13 positions. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the background to narrow it down. Uh, and doing interviews twice a week, it's overwhelming. So. Mid-January is usually the time when mid to about second to third week of January when most programs start to wind down their interviews. Uh, and then the rank order list work starts maybe in the beginning of February into March. So this, depending on the, the final date, it's March 2nd this year. A few years ago, it was a little bit earlier. So I would say that late January is that ideal time because we are done with interviews. We have an idea of who we want to rank. Uh, you know, the wheels are turning. We are trying to figure out how to create that list. The preliminary work is done. Uh, I think that's a good time for that reminder because then once we start looking at the list, then those names pop up in the back of my mind. Okay, this person contacted. You know, they had some good points. Uh, it may make a little bit of a difference. All right, excellent. So this last question was by Misbah Arif. Um, Next question, I think we talked about this, is by Aisha Anwar. What about emailing the program? Do you want to rank? Uh, you want to rank first? Does it result in a negative or positive impact? So I think the panel um, talked about this uh, just just right now. Um, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, have a neg negative impact, but if you can have a snor short snippet or a, or a um, snapshot of your credentials and one or two lines of exactly why you want this location. Um, maybe something personal that you can connect with that you're living in that area or you have this fellowship in this in the program that you really want to go into fellowship further on uh, just one or two lines just about that so people know okay so the program director may think okay let me give this this person a break let me give him or her um, a chance with my program let, let's let's rank her maybe that may work okay one more question by Muhammad 
Actually, let me just quickly add to this this last thing. So exactly, so keeping it personal can make a big difference. And again, if you know someone in that program, if it's a colleague, if it's a senior or someone, uh, without really dwelling on it and using it as a strong connection, mentioning that, that, you know, I already know someone in the program and I've heard good things about it uh, is okay. Uh, Because it does remind me that, okay, you know what, this person knows this resident that I have who I like because they are good residents. Let me, you know, I may go back to them and ask them, what do you think? You know, this person knows you and they'll give me some, maybe able to put a good word in for you. The second part is going to be personalization is extremely important. Don't make a form email and send it to 50 programs. Uh, Cutting and pasting doesn't work. When you go from a desktop to a phone or a phone to a desktop, the fonts change. So I very often see an email that looks really nice, but you can clearly see that the name of the program is in a different font. That means it's cut and paste. Right. Uh, And that really... uh, leaves a bad taste because you know, okay, it's not personal, it's just going to everyone. So make that little effort, uh, it does show and it makes a difference. Right, excellent. Um, yeah, that, that's very important. So personalization is very important in, in a way that at least what one line in there that you can correlate with that program, at least just one line just to get get the person attention and make sure you're not, you're not running into the font problem that we just talked about. Yeah. Um, All right. Dr. Khan? Yes. Hey, this is Dr. Maruf, uh, Sharon. Um, uh, can I have my two cents? Sure, yes, yes, definitely. Yes, uh, yeah. nice to join, uh, nice to yeah. have you join. I think I talked to you offline yes. someplace, if yes. I remember, yes. right, excellent. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, just a quick uh, um, you know, introduction. I'm Sharon Maruf, um, I'm public critical care, um, currently in uh, assistant professor, University of um, So uh, in summary, we discussed about the rank order list. I think there's a very good video um, on NRMP about how the match works. So in summary, you can rank whatever program you want and you will not be um, unranked because you ranked some program high and some program low. As long as any program ranks you amongst their top candidates, you will be matched. It's just your preference about which one you want to rank up or down. So make this thing very clear that you would be ranked if any program has ranked you higher, as long as you rank them anywhere in your list. Now it depends how are you going to proceed with the rank order list? What are the factors that you should choose while you're choosing a program? So we discussed about um, some of the points, but I think we need to discuss about visa visa issues uh, because I've been dealing with this, um, you know, visa candidates and all that for so many years. So in the past, the J1 versus H1 used to be a very big factor in determining which program you would want to rank. Um, For example, people would say like, if you are going for a fellowship, J1 programs are better because you you can have fellowship max easily when you're a J1 visa. Vice versa, in H1, it used to be more directed towards you getting a green card first and then you can apply for fellowship, but not right afterwards. But in the present scenario, um, for the last couple of years, H1 visas have been hard to come by. So if you are going to rank a program based on H1 visa preference, just make sure that they were able to offer the H1B visas over the last couple of years, because the programs that used to offer H1B visas traditionally have not been able to offer H1B visas in the last couple of years. So that one big factor that used to determine like which program, like one of the factors that used to determine the programs that you're going to um, rank highly, you know, you should still consider it because some programs may still be able to give you H1B visa. But what I'm trying to explain to you is be very careful just because they have a history of, um, you know, getting an H1B visa approved, um, that not be the case in the next year or in the coming year. So one thing you can look at is like, were the candidates in the last year, were they able to get H-1B visa from that program? Because personally, I know so many programs that used to offer H-1B visas and they tried last year and they couldn't get it. They tried year before it and they couldn't get it. So I don't expect those programs to be able to offer H-1B visas this year as well. So be very careful if um, H-1B visa program, if they are saying that they will be able to offer you H-1B visa, be very careful that they were able to actually got 
you know, able to get that H-1B visa process approved in the last couple of years. That's number one. Number two, again, as we talked about the academic, um, you know, I think everyone talked about the academic profile. And then there are like financial, um, you know, preferences as well. For example, there are some places who are very expensive to live in. So if you want to consider your expenses, like, you know, how are you going to be able to afford your family if you're married, if you have kids and things like that. So those are also important as well. So just think about that as well. Like if you're ranking a program that's in like Los Angeles, like, you know, let's see, um, you know, how much money that you're going to be making. That should not be like the top priority, but some people do. Some people make it a top priority because they have families, they have families in the US and they want to be able to support their families. So that's one of the factors that you should consider as well. But again, these are the factors that you can consider, but then at the days and it's your choice, then you can choose whatever program that you want on top and you would be ranked as long as any program has ranked you amongst their top candidates. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, yes, let me just uh, quickly, uh, <clears throat> so with the H1, uh, like chime in, so a lot of programs still do. There are two issues with H1. Mm -hmm. uh, number one issue is just the political climate. So over the past couple of years, that has made a difference because there is a higher likelihood of delay. Uh, getting the application in, getting it approved, and then getting it stamped, a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, so we often see candidates getting coming in late. Now, not every program is generous about it. Some program would allow you to come in late a few weeks later, and some will say, no, if by two to three weeks your application is not complete, uh, we will go on to the next candidate. So you have to be mindful of that. Uh, the second part with H1 is that it's not only uh, the sponsorship part, it, it's a huge uh, financial part for the program. So on average, it's a seven to $8,000 cost to get an H1 visa uh, with all the fees and everything combined. And then there is a continuation fee every single year. So the programs have to put that in their budget. So what they do is and in our program, we go to our institute and they say, this year we can approve you for this many H1s max. Uh, so if they say this, they're going to approve three H1 visas, the top three people on our rank order list uh, will be able to get that, but anyone under that list may not be able to. So there's always going to be that even if programs do uh, sponsor H1 visas, not every candidate may be able to now, usually it works out. It's not that huge a number, but you know, those all of those things you have to keep in mind uh, to be mentally prepared that yes, if it's not H1, it's going to be a J1. But at the same time, I think the most important thing is you getting into a program uh, that you really want to be in. One thing I, I would like to add is, as Dr. Maruf mentioned about the H1 and J1, I think that's a very important topic. Our program uh, over the past seven years has moved away from H1 to solely being J1. So like there was tradition of offering as Dr. Maru said, let's just look back and see if they are offering. The second part is that there are more and more US graduates now and somewhere in the Capitol Hill, there's a movement of trying to retain their own US, IMG, uh, US graduates compared to IMGs. So that is just making it harder for us, uh, people who are like IMGs like us, uh, to retain this position. That's another reason that they're trying to make H1 even more difficult. And you know how with Trump organization last four years, it has been more and more tougher and more and more uh, stricter uh, regulations because I was involved in this H1 business and we were not able to offer uh, H1 to any candidate because of political cloud being so heavy against H1 uh, visa and whole immigration business. Uh, the second part that Dr. Maruf did touch on it, and I just wanted to explain that one more part of, about school districts. I know like as an IMG, we don't care about like where we end up matching as long as we match, but if you are a great candidate, please consider school districts as part of your child's education because school districts do matter in the United States where you end up. Uh, so when you come here, uh, start considering how far, how close you can live because that will also impact how much money you can save for your family and for your kids uh, to support. Excellent. And just to um, thank you, Dr. Maru, for joining us. And we talked to him uh, offline previously, and he was working today, and he's, I think, already on call right now. So thank you for joining us with your valuable input. Um, yes, so the basic question is, research your program and about the visa issue, definitely research your program, but also look at the political climate and how it may affect 
your decisions and the ability of the program to actually offer you a spot. So okay. we have a couple of questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions um, from Muhammad Hassan. Um, if someone has sent a letter of intent by email to a program, would sending a written letter of intent be recommended? Um, yeah, let me just cut this short because I think we have a few more questions. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't overload them. I think that was the response from Dr. Wasik Mirza and Dr. Najam that just don't overload um, the program. Make sure they're nice, short and sweet and to the point and you have to add something personal as they had already mentioned. Make sure it's something personal in there and don't make any mistakes such as the font mistakes. Next question by uh, Yus uh, Yusra Khalid. Can no, no, we mention- is, your name. I'm sorry. Uh, can people mute if they are not uh, uh, talking? Please mute your uh, mute, mute on your side. Thank you. So Yusra Khal has a question. Can we mention that I am going to rank your program on top of my list? Or should I just say that I intend to rank your program highly? If so you... It's a, yeah. Go ahead. If you, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's... it's um, you should be honest. And if you feel this is going to be you, you're going to mention this in your email. And if you're going to say I'm going to write, rank your uh, program on the top of the list, just give a one or two lines to say why you're going to rank on the top of your list. And I think the program director may know that you may be sending this email to multiple programs. But if you do write a couple of reasons with your email, with your, uh, your intent of interest, then maybe that makes a better impression. And of course, uh, the program director will see whether this candidate is a good match for us. Um, and based on their interests, they'll consider it. Uh, they should def definitely consider it. But uh, intend to rank your program highly. I think it's not a big deal. What do you think, Dr. Wasik? I don't, I don't think it's a big deal. Yeah, it's, you know, um, from my personal experience, again, you know, uh, I think going back to it, you need to be honest. If you feel strongly that this is the program you're going to put at the top of your list and you have good reasons for it, you can say it. Uh, you know, it actually saying that you are going to rank a program highly doesn't really tell me anything. I don't know if you had one interview or you had 35 interviews. Highly could mean anything. Uh, so, you know, making sure that you give your reason why is, is the most important. Thing. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, so Aisha Anwar has a question uh, in the email, terms like ranking first or ranking high, does that make any difference? I think we just talked about it. Second question is ranking a new versus old program, does it have any impact? New versus old program, program that is brand new, especially if you like the environment of the program. So you're saying if you like the environment of the new program, and well, I think, let me uh, just to, I don't know what the answer is gonna be from the uh, from our panel, but if you like the program and if it's new, then 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 go for it. If it's, that's what you like, then then definitely go for it. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Najam? Um, I think it depends on your goals, future goals. If you feel like that you're not sure if the new program is gonna provide you with a jump start for your fellowships or your future trainings, then yeah, go for the program that has established alumni that is maybe also does have a fellowship because new programs, and Dr. Mirza knows this very well, they have to set up for three years to establish their own fellowships. So if you have a program that has their own internal fellowships and you're highly, highly dead set on doing a fellowship and you're not like, gonna stay in internal medicine, sure, you can consider them a higher, but I think if you really like a new program, that new program could be much, much better in long term compared to the old program that is already established. So you just cannot tell what the trajectory of the new program will be. Yeah, new program will be easier to match because a lot of the Americans will not be putting that program into their mix. Um, so that's and, question, uh, yeah. Quickly, you know, because, you know, we are a new program and we are in the second year currently and uh, going for our third year coming in. Uh, Again, you know, what Najam said exactly, you know, those things can impact what your total plans are. The culture in a new program can be very different. Uh, 
there's a lot of things that are going on. So obviously you can be on that ground floor, you can have an impact. So if you feel like, you know, it's a legacy you want to bring in, you want to help that program, it's going to be a great thing to be in. But at the same time, there's also a little bit of uncertainty. Things change, uh, things are going to be moving in different directions as we are adjusting to a new program and what we are doing. So you have to think about a person that, are you someone who can adjust to change, who is someone who uh, is able to be a part of that? Uh, someone who says, no, you know what? I like to be in an established system where I know exactly how things are. Uh, then it's a different scenario. Uh, so you have to see because you know every new program will have a, a culture that's going to be rapidly changing. It's exciting, but it can be a little daunting as well. Right. So when you interviewed, of course, this, these were not in-person interviews, Maybe you got a good vibe about the program. And of course, the program director is the head and the, how the person at the top acts generates the whole mentality and the, and the frame of work at that program. So if you interviewed at, at a certain program and you felt good vibes, then maybe, yeah, that, that's, that's good for you. I'll move on. We have a few more questions coming. And uh, I don't want to miss any question. And yes, it's a question about the soap. and. I did note down in my notes that we were going to get to this post-mass situation. So do we need to start working on anything now for the soap? Or how can we prepare for the soap early if anything bad happens on match day? Basically, if somebody does not match, what, what do you suggest? And uh, Dr. Najam, maybe I'll talk to you first about this. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. And Dr. Sure. Sharam and Dr. Vasik, we'll go in that order. Sure, sure. I think the, by the proxy of the fact that you applied for match, you should be preparing for soap. That day can happen to anyone, and that's an unfortunate day, but that can happen. Some situations are actually unique in a sense that your USMLE score came late, you, your ECFMG certificate came late, so some people would just go into soap. I have seen that as well in a sense that that saves them some money through the NRMP process and all, but you still have to apply through the ERAS and be eligible for the soap. If that happens, I think that that will then then you have to ramp up your ramp up your efforts a little bit more. You have to reach out to your their faculty. You have to reach out to their because soap also means that the program went unmatched. So you have to look at from the uh, program standpoint too because we have a situation two years ago when we went unmatched. Um, I don't know what that means. Um, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, um, so we went unmatched. With, that was a chaos in our program. That was the first time our program met, one, went unmatched because we were only looking for people with, uh, with uh, citizens or green cards and that happened to our program. So the program is also looking. So reach out to the faculty, reach out to the uh, candidates. If you know anybody there, that would be your best source at that point because they have to make the decisions quickly. And those decisions are made over the phone or over the email within like minutes. Uh, I have seen people call in, get an interview over the phone and match like within an hour. So I think ramping up the situation, but preparing for that day is essential because if you're applying for match, I hope it never happens to anybody, but it will, it can happen and you will end up in soap. Excellent, Dr. Uh, Maruf. Uh, yeah, so at the very minimum, I think you should be familiar with how the soap works. I think most people make this mistake, you know, going to the match that they never even think about soap um, hopefully it doesn't happen with you but if it does at least you need to be familiar with how the process works right what is soap how do you apply for this how do you reach out to the programs and then secondly when the soap actually um, you know post match actually starts um, there's a lot of information like flying around at that time like facebook posts um, there are the un, un, like you should be involved with these groups such as app MKANA, APNA, YPC page. There's so many, um, you know, IMG friendly Facebook or WhatsApp pages and groups and things like that. They quickly distribute information about those programs. So your best bet is you get the information quickly. Then you try to reach out to someone that's in the program and you can send them an email. Hey, I'm in the town. I like this program. I'm unmatched. Can you put in a word for me, basically? Right. Before I do go to Dr. Vasik, I remember back in the day, that NRMP had a list on their website, a PDF list of all the programs for the last couple of years who did not match. And they, they may have gone to SOAP post-match or not, but NRMP has a list of programs at least 15 years ago, 10 years ago, actually, not that long, um, that they, you could look at. So look at their website and maybe you can find it. Dr. Vasik, any thoughts on this topic? 
Right. So I think uh, what Basharam and Najam said exactly, you need to be prepared. Uh, anything can happen again, hopefully not, but anyone can be in that situation. Uh, what you need to do is, and again, you know your profile better than anybody else. You know, how many interviews you had, what kind of interviews you had, um, what are the risks and, and the chances of you matching. Deep down, we all have an idea, but no matter what, I think being prepared, and a couple of things is again, knowing the list of programs potentially who may remain unmatched historically, uh, keeping an eye on any resources that will give you those things. The next thing is how prepared you are for that process, because all that happens really fast. So what's different this year is <clears throat> post-match used to be a long process. So you'll start on Monday, you find out you matched or not matched. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there are stages of you know first stage, second stage, third stage. They have changed it to one stage now. So everything will happen on the 17th of March this year. Uh, I think that's, if, I, if I'm correct, it, everything is happening on that Thursday in one day. So it's going to be a mad rush to the finish line and a lot will be going on. So you have to be prepared. So having an application ready, PDFs, exactly a folder, put it in a file folder, save it for later, call it post-match, whichever way you want to label it. You need to have everything on your fingertips that as soon as you find out, all you have to do is click and you transmit that. Right. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some little changes in each program, but the more prepared you are, uh, you know, in, in that situation, a minute or two can make a huge difference. Uh, as Najam mentioned, we, I have seen programs calling a person and just on that five minute conversation say, you know what, we like this person. Let's give them an offer right now because no one wants to risk going unmatched, both right. from the program perspective as well. So, you know, the more ready you are, the higher your likelihood. Excellent. Question, so what, email or fax? One last thing I would add to this unmatched soap part is please do not not rank programs. Let's say you have 16 programs. Do not just settle for 12. Rank all 16. I have seen people having that many interviews and go unmatched because they did not rank everybody please rank everybody on your list. Excellent. I've seen, exactly. I've seen people with 16, 20 interviews, not match, excellent scores, excellent CV. And I've seen candidates, not that great. One interview and Fine. they matched. We've, we've seen so many people and they're doing well. And I've seen people get into post-match, get into post-match and now they're super specialists. So don't think if you don't rank, you, you, so you don't match, you're anything less than anybody else. Doesn't matter at all. So rank every single one. Good point, Najem. Um, I'm going to go on. Kashif Salim has a question. How do you do a con contagious, a contagious ranking, transitional ear and neurology? Okay. So a transitional ear. So um, I think that's definitely a topic, a different topic as such, a transitional ear. Uh, let's say if you're going for a um, second year position, advanced, uh, advanced position in the second year, any thoughts on the transitional year? Does it make any difference? I think the principles would, would be the same. Or preliminary medicine or preliminary surgery. I think tra transitional year is a, is a year where you, can, you rotate through different specialties in that year. Similarly, there's a preliminary medicine and a preliminary surgery residency for one year. Uh, any thoughts on these sub programs? So oh, um, I think the principles, uh, the same principles apply for matching in the prelim and transitional years. I think the crux of the question is like how, what is the order of your ranking? I think it's it's your personal preference and it's a program to program dependent, um, you know, team. Some programs pick their transitional years quickly. Um, you know, for example, they have like four or five transitional um, year candidates um, um, and they have only one um, traditionally going into their categorical program, then they are likely to pick only one from their transitional year, right? And some programs only have one or two transitional years and one prelim, and they have a big program, and they usually pick all two or three um, from their transitional years. So definitely you should rank those programs higher, which have more number of categorical residency slots and less number of transitional and prelim slots um, in contrast to those, those programs who have more transitional and more prelim preliminary slots and they uh, traditionally don't really 
take the prelim or transitional candidates into categorical um, um, categorical programs next year. Um, and the, the basic principles of matchings are still the same. You rank your top program on top and vice versa. You just go, go down the list as the programs that you would like to choose. All right, so I have a couple more questions. I'm gonna to try to go through this quickly since we are reaching our um, uh, finishing point. Aisha Anwar is asking, the letter of intent should be directed towards the program director or should also be written to program coordinator or other faculty who interviewed you? So let me just, uh, just say what I suggest. Um, of course, um, if definitely you should send a letter of intent to the person who interviewed you. I think that's perfectly fine. And if you do have a program director's uh, email, then shoot them that, that email that we talked about, that targeted email, that personalized email. Yes, yeah, send that, don't overload them send that in this period, a month, uh, uh, two, two weeks before the rank order list is finalized. Yes, send that. I think you guys agree or any, any thoughts on this? I think program director is, is the person who ultimately will be responsible uh, for that final list. So that will be the person you need to focus on. Obviously sending uh, something to the faculty that interviewed you is always a good thing because they may appreciate it and put a good word in for you. Yeah, the only difference is that not all the faculty who will interview may be part of the rank order list process. Uh, there's a committee that works on it, but it has a limited number of people in it. Some programs pull everyone in. Uh, in our program, it's a smaller group that makes that final decision. So that faculty email may not get to the right person. So definitely uh, it's good courtesy to reach out to them, but keeping program director in uh, that loop is extremely important. Excellent. Uh, next question is from Yusra Khalid. Do the programs rank couples match candidates as a couple do or they rank individually? Basically the question is how do you rank on your side if there's a couples, couples match, a, a people applying as a couple? So it, obviously couples match is, is important from you know, the candidate's perspective. You know, it ensures that you are going to be in the same program. And in the long run, it's such much more convenient for you as a family. Uh, at the same time, programs can be limited in how strongly do they look at couples. So for example, in our program, we have, I think four or five couples who have applied. Now, it, it gets complicated if you have five couples in the same program. So if you have 13 positions and five of them are couples, it gets a little bit more complicated from uh, a lot of logistical purposes. So what we will do is we'll say, okay, who is our number one couple? So we will pick one and we will rank them high, but the others may be pushed down. So every program is going to make decisions differently. So the second part is going to be, you can make it or break it, break each other. So we've had a candidate who we really liked and they said, okay, you know what? My husband is also applying. Can you interview him as well? And we say, oh, okay. Or we didn't realize that we interviewed both, but one lifted the other one up or, you know, dragged them down. It's just, you know, they had a bad day. It's had nothing to do with the candidate. Sometimes it can, it can make a big difference. So it, it's a personal choice. Uh, how strongly, because obviously if you're not going as a couple match, you can always both make a good impression and the programs will make that effort to put you together. Uh, but at the same time, there's no guarantee. So it's a personal choice as to how strongly you feel that you need to be in the same program or you're going to apply to programs, you know, at least in a close geographical location to ensure that you're not too far away. So, excellent, excellent. All right, uh, Aisha, Anwar, uh, sorry, Mispa, Arif has a question. Is I there any fee for to apply for the SOAP programs? I think you may have to look at on the website, the NRMP website and see if there's a fee um, yeah, I think maybe that's probably the best way. I don't know if anybody has any okay. other input on this fee. Next question so, is Aisha. Aisha regarding, I think yes. Dr. Maruf has a comment. Regarding couples match, I do have a comment. We usually do not strongly recommend you one way or the other in anything because that's your personal choice. But regarding couples match, I do want to warn you that um, the chances of getting matched as an IMG in a couples match are very, very slim. So whoever I've spoken to over the many years, no one has actually strongly recommended people to do couples match, unless you are green card or a US citizen, then definitely go for it. This couples match is actually a US phenomena, to be honest. It's not directed towards IMGs, if I have to be very bluntly honest with you. 
your best bet would be if you are both good candidates you know you can go and you know on the on the you know you've already done your interviews you can rank your programs in the same order like your top programs in the same order that would be your best bet people actually rank the programs who are spouse friendly so that unfortunately if one of you guys could not be matched the next year you can get that spouse to your program that's a very decent way to approach it as well rather than going both in the couples match and you know going unmatched again that's your personal decision but i do want to say that most people i've spoken to like like the program directors and you know and the senior senior physicians um, who have been through this process many many years and myself i have been involved with five six years as well so i do know um, how the residency program usually works so i would not recommend going for a couples match being an img all right so consider your situation consider your situation yeah. with anything and um, yeah. see what's best for you yeah. okay next question is um, from aisha anwar uh, can we contact programs during soap yeah i think uh, the, but the but the panel was mentioning that you have to you know prepare for the soap and see whoever is your contact in the program so most likely if you are going into the soap you will be reaching the program director through contacts within the program is that correct maybe a, a short answer is that correct anybody Yes, any and any time, right? So the, whoever the contact is for that program is going to be the person to contact. Just make sure that you you know which programs are unmatched, and then you know just focus on it. Uh, we often get emails asking if you have an opening, even though we have completely matched. That means you haven't done your homework. Uh, not that it makes any difference at that point, but just make sure exactly you don't want to waste your resources. Focus on exactly who you want to contact, and then go for it. Uh, All right, and Kashi Samli, I think qualified his question. He said just yes, prelim, and then uh, Larib uh, Jan- Jamani has a question. What's the difference between applying for a transitional year, prelim, a prelim year, or categorical training? Okay, so uh, people who have went through this match may have some idea already, but yeah, there is normally some confusion. I'll relay what I have uh, information on this. Transitional year is basically what normally American graduates do when they're not sure which residency they want to go into. I'm pretty sure uh, foreigners can apply there also, but you rotate to different specialties. You could be medicine, surgery, radiology, gynecology, you rotate to different uh, specialties. Prelim, prelim year is you do a prelim year of medicine, internal medicine, you, or you do a prelim year of general surgery. So that's called preliminary medicine or preliminary surgery. Categoricals are your straight internal medicine, surgery, urology, things like that. So that's categorical. Uh, if, if that's incorrect, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move forward to the next question. Uh, yeah, that's correct. That's all right. Uh, uh, Hello, Dr. Omar. So, yes, Kashan. Sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yes, we can apply a transitional year. And it's like preliminary. After that, you can apply neurology or uh, ophthalmology, radiology, other specialties too. That it's is like correct. Preliminary exactly, yeah. Medicine. That that's the that's the run up. The preliminary is a run up to a advanced level position, basically a PGY two position. Uh, for example, neurology requires you to have a prelim year in medicine or something else, so that you have some exposure to the medical floor. Uh, Dr. Deepak uh, Kumar is asking if ever someone or someone has already taken step three and waiting for results, will that up, will that update to a program help in ranking? So, meaning at this point, at this rank order list time. Is it beneficial for somebody to update uh, update their application and let them know, hey, my step three is in. What do you think about my application now? And can you rank me? Is, is that a good, a good thing to do? Um, it doesn't really make a huge difference. Like from the visa perspective, depending on the deadline for the program for step threes, again, if you're considering H1s, it can, uh, it's more of a heads up than anything else. Uh, in terms of ranking, no. Because again, uh, if you have done your step one and step two, and those are the bases that we interviewed, you on, uh, step three is not going to make a huge difference. Uh, very rarely if someone is on the fence and their step one and two scores are fine and we are thinking, okay, you know, which way do we go? And you have a really stellar step three score, you know, maybe it can make a difference, but it's, it's very unlikely at that stage. Uh, but letting the program know, sending an email that I've cleared it uh, as an FYI, there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Would, Ex- uh, yes, would that uh, change uh, with USMLE being pass and fail, step one? Uh, it still wouldn't make a huge difference because, again, the, the main decision to rank, because, again, once the interviews are done, 
a preliminary basic rank order list is already there. Right. Uh, the rest is just moving uh, up and down a little bit. So at that stage, unless you are one of those people that we have marked that, okay, let's wait for the step three mm -hmm. to make a final judgment, uh, it doesn't make a big difference. Okay, excellent. Uh, Dr. Kumar has another question, and I think it, it, it will carry forward from the last question. Is it okay to update about step three in a letter of intent as well? Yeah, probably it's a, it's a, it's a good place to just update about your step three. And um, I think we're good. We have ran out of time. Thank you, Dr. Maru, for being able to join uh, during your shift. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Najam, Dr. Dr. Vasik Mirza, um, and a uh, vote of thanks to everybody who has uh, taken part in this session and your questions. And uh, of course, you can reach out to us if you have any further topic. If, this, if that is a big enough topic and it's pertinent and people are interested, then we can look to have another session. Would the panel be potentially available in the future as well? Sure. Sure. Excellent. Excellent. Sure. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so Thank much. You. And I will let everybody go about their day. Thank you so much for joining, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.